Thank you so very much. God bless you. You can be seated. What a joy to be at this great house tonight. Thank you so much for allowing me to be here. I want to give honor to your pastors, Pastor Manuel, your lovely wife and family. I appreciate so very much your host hospitality. And uh, it is a joy for me to grace this pulpit and to be with this great ministry. You are spoiled. Indeed, God has blessed you. And you are so blessed to enjoy great worship, this great team, these great pastors, uh, Pastor Reynolds, Pastor Reuben. Uh, we got them all. Pastor Malcolm, uh, my host here, uh, Brother Nelson has helped me tonight. Uh, uh, then yesterday I got to eat lunch with Bis Bishop Lazarus in his home. And uh, I want to tell you, uh, his wife is an amazing cook. And uh, she showed off yesterday, y'all. <laughs> she did. And uh, so I give honor to all of these great men and women of God, their families. And uh, I'm thankful that I get to be here with you tonight. Uh, I think uh, <clears throat> at, uh, I, I'm lost because I come from America. I've never been in South Africa. I, uh, I've been in about 15 countries now. I've been married 33 years. And I'm used to my wife telling me where to go and what to do. Come on. <laughs> so, but uh, I'm blessed. Yes, yes. So, but uh, I don't know where the main campus is. I've been there last night and enjoyed great worship and great service. And uh, Pastor Maury is preaching there tonight, but you're at the better place. We're going to have fun, but we're going to have church. Yes. I love Jesus, don't you? Yes. I'm thankful for God's grace in my life. I've needed it, and I'm thankful to receive it. Anybody? You're grateful for the grace of Almighty God? Wow. And last night, uh, Pastor Emmanuel, what a wonderful word from God he gave on honor. And I had breakfast with him this morning, and it was good to chat with him and do to share ministry together and uh, just thankful for what God is doing through his ministry and, and family lineage. I love family lineage. I come from a family of ministers. My dad and my grandfather, my grandmother was a minister. I know some people don't like women ministers, but you got to deal with that. So not me. <clears throat> so, uh, my brother's a minister. He pastors a great church that my dad started back in 1968. And uh, when I was one year old, you do the math, I'm 30. So anyway, um, <laughs> been preaching 40 years now. This is my 40th year of ministry. And uh, God has been good to me. <clears throat> he really has. So uh, I pastor a wonderful church in the state of Georgia in uh, the United States, and uh, I'm thankful for those wonderful people. God is blessing our church, and we have wonderful growth, and God has been so good to us. And uh, I'm, I'm so thankful that when I come across the world to South Africa, I feel the same Holy Spirit that I feel in the United States. It's right here. It's a familiar spirit. And I'm thankful for the anointing in this house. That says something about your leadership. These pastors love God, and they want to see a move of God. And I hope you came tonight ready to experience a move from the Lord. Because I didn't fly all the way across this world, 16 hours on one flight to get here for you, not to get into this thing tonight. Come on, somebody. So... We're going to hopefully see what Jesus will do tonight. Now, last night, uh, the pastor talked about honor. Tonight, I want to give you another key. And I don't know if they've got special keys here that they keep them in order, but I may just mess all of that up tonight. So if I get it out of order, just bear with me. I'm from the United States, and I'm going home soon. So <laughs> you will be rid of me. But let's look at God's word. And if you do not mind, I always ask my house to stand for God's reading in his word. So if you don't mind, honor with me, please. 
We'll start with Matthew chapter 16 and one verse, verse 19. And it says this, and I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. And whatever you bind on the earth will be bound in heaven. And whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. I'm grateful that God allows what we speak to come into order. The Bible says that we are captivated by the words that come out of our mouth. The Bible says life and death are actually in our mouth. I see life and death many times in people's hands when they rise up against each other. But there's nothing worse than the slow death of someone who continues to always find the fault and the difficulty and the negativity in this life. I like to be around someone who has faith to move mountains and to see what God will do. I don't like negative people. You know when they walk in a room. They suck all the energy out of the room. The lights dim 20%. The air goes thick. I mean, it's just the way they are. But I'm thankful for faith-filled people. People who know God. People who know he's a miracle-working God. People who know where they came from and know if it were not for the Lord, we would not be in this room tonight. Come on now. Now, Ephesians chapter 4, in two verses I want to center in on tonight. And I believe this will be a blessing to all of us. I pray it will. The Bible says in verse 11, And he himself gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers for the equipping of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying, listen to this, of the body of Christ. I want to read verse 12 one more time. He gave these gifts to the church for a reason, for the equipping, the working of the saints in the work of ministry. You have to be able to have what you need in order to do the job he requires. And the Bible says the requirement is to edify, to benefit, to bless the body of Christ. Aren't you thankful that God wants to use you? So, Father, in the name of Jesus Christ, I pray tonight that you will rest heavy on this congregation, that you will help me to, to, uh, to convey what you would have for this house and these people this evening. We came to see you, not somebody standing in a pulpit. We came to hear from you, not somebody standing behind a lectern. God, we ask you tonight to move in this house. May your spirit be prevalent as we look to you now, in Jesus' name. Come on, everybody say, Amen. you can be seated. Thank you so much for honoring the word of the Lord. <clears throat> Tonight I want to talk to you a little bit about the key of potential. The key of potential. You could also, if you wanted a title, you could call it ready for the shift. I believe God is shifting some things. And I believe as time is winding down, and I believe Jesus is coming very soon, he is shifting things and shifting people into position where he can utilize them for his glory. The Bible talks about the potential in a person, but I want to I want to kind of if I can define two words for you. Shift. My definition goes like this. It's to move or cause to move from one place to another. To change in emphasis of direction or focus. I'm going to say it again. To move or to cause to move from one place to another. It's a change in your emphasis, change in direction, or change in focus. I explain it similarly as the wind would shift direction. And all of a sudden you thought it was coming from the east and now the wind comes from the west. So it changes rather quickly and with really without warning. 
The word potential is another word that's defined as having or showing the capacity to become or develop into something in the future. Having or showing the capacity to become or to develop into something in the future. Too many times, and I want you to listen tonight, too many times we have people who do not walk in the fullness of their potential, either because Satan has blinded them from it, or they feel their past cancels them from achieving it. Because we always, everyone always looks to their past. All of us, if we really get real, we know we're all sinners or former sinners. We're all people that came out of bondages of sin and stronghold. It took the grace of God to change us and to conform us into his image. But we need to understand that God has great potential in this room right now. And the enemy, the enemy doesn't fear your past, but he does fear your potential. Hear me now. Your past does not bother Satan at all. What does bother the enemy, the devil, is what you could be if you grab God's hand tonight. If you understand what God can do in your life and through your life, that will affect the enemy that is trying to hinder you tonight. If you just realize who you are in Christ, it can literally change the atmosphere and it can change the direction of your life. I want to center in on a, a couple of points here. I'm a point guy. Sometimes my wife says, you had no point. She really doesn't do that. She's probably going to watch this, and I'm going to be in trouble on the flight home. All right, you are not. It, it, let me give you number one. Number one, it is, it is not who you are. Listen to that. It is not who you are. It is who you are not. Now, I'm playing on words here, but just bear with me. It is not who you are, number one. It is not who you are. It is who you are not. Let me explain. You are not called by your past. You are not called by your problem. And you are not called by your predicament. Please hear me. You are not called by these things. You are not called by your past. You're not called by the problem you may have. And you're not called by the predicament that you may find yourself in. But you are called by who you are. Let me explain. You are not a recovering drug addict. You are not an ex-con. You are not a recovering alcoholic. You are not a former liar. You are not a former cheater. You are not a former adulterer. You are not a former gambler. And I could go on and on with the list. But the Bible says that you are a brand new creature in Christ. 2 Corinthians 5, 17 says it this way. Therefore, if any one is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. Stop acting and thinking like a victim. And start acting and thinking like the victor you are in Christ. God has given you the victory through his son Jesus Christ. You need to understand what title now that you hold. You are no longer a former anything. You are now a blood-bought child of the Most High God. And what he has done in you, no enemy can take from you. Isaiah 54 and verse 17 says it this way. No weapon formed against you, shall prosper. I like the rest of this verse. And every tongue which rises against you in judgment, you shall condemn. This is the heritage of the servants of the Lord, and their righteousness, listen, is from me, says the Lord. Come on, somebody. God has placed incredible potential inside each and every one of you here tonight. 
However, until we commit ourselves to the task of obediently seeking him, we actually condemn ourselves and even sometimes content ourselves with being mediocre. You may have had a tough week. You may have had a tough month. You may have even had a tough year. You may have faltered or even failed God. But I can assure you that God's promise to you still stands if your promise is to abide in him. Let me, uh, let me just unpack that just for a moment. So that means as long as I refuse to relinquish Christ, there is hope for me no matter what circumstance I find myself in. Come on. Do I need to explain that again? Because you didn't move. As long as I do not relinquish my stand in Christ, then no matter what the enemy does, it will not stop what God has begun in you. Somebody needs to hear. You need to refuse to lose with God. Jeremiah 33, 3 says, call to me. I will answer you. I will show you great and mighty things which you do not know. Sometimes we think that what we have done in the past or the situation we are currently in disqualifies us from reaching our full potential in Jesus Christ, but God's word reveals to us that destiny is a series of choices regardless of our past or current circumstances, and you can start making right choices right now. God, if we will put him into our lives and put him first, uh, then some way, somehow, all of these things begin to work themselves out. What you thought was a step back, God was just positioning you to take a better step forward. What the enemy tried to do to stop you, God actually orchestrated to use you in order to help propel you into the future that he has for you. So you need to understand it is not who you are, but it is really who you are not. Number two, God gave gifts to the church. I'm going to talk to some of these pastors tonight. I want to bless you. But I also want to talk to you, the congregation. The Bible says in Ephesians 4.11, and he himself gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors, some teachers. Now, you really do need to value those who you allow to speak in your life. God reacts to how you treat those that he has sent into your life. Be careful how you talk about the gift that God has blessed you with. I believe every pastor needs a pastor. I believe every man of God needs a spiritual mentor in their life. Now, my dad was a pastor, but he was my dad. But God gave me a pastor that I sat under who pastored a very large church, a great ministry. And I would call him and talk with him often. One day he called me and said, I want you to come be with me. And so I did. And for a couple of years, I just was there with him. And I would preach at his great mega church whenever he wanted me to. I traveled all the time preaching. But when he said, you're here, I'm here. If he went to a trip, he said, I want you with me. So I would go with him. And I'll never forget one time, and he was in the state of Texas, and I'll never forget one time, he called and he said, I'm, I'm having a little trouble with my voice, and so I want you to go, be prepared to preach, but we're leaving, and I just want you with me. I said, yes, sir, and so I go, and I get in the car, and I'm just, I'm just there to help him. I'm going to be his armor bearer, whatever he needs me to be. I'm just there with my pastor, and I remember going to a place called Hunt, Texas, H-U-N-T, Hunt, Texas, which is nowhere. It's the middle of nowhere. There's one caution light, a light, one light. And when we got there, we turned left onto a dirt road. And I'm thinking, Pastor, do you know where you're going? And he said, just a little further. And when he got over the hill down in this valley, 
was a tent that seated 5,000 people. And I did not realize it, but he began to tell me that one of the bishops that was in South Africa went there because God told him to build a community. And so they were training their own people to come. They had bought land and they were going to fill this valley up with homes and a huge church. And this was the beginning. And they called him to come and help them preach and just enjoy Jesus. So when we get there, I'm just there carrying the briefcase. I'm carrying the water. I'm, I'm just there. And pastor meets the great bishop and we go get under the tent. And that night, more than 5,000 people came from nowhere and sat under that tent. And I found out that they were building a 10,000 seat auditorium and that one day it would be a 100,000 seat auditorium in that valley. And I want you to know, I leaned forward to my pastor and I said, how is your voice? <laughs> and he leaned back and he said, I think I got it. And I said, well, I don't. I just want you to know, I've never prayed against you, pastor, until tonight. <laughs> but he did an excellent job and God moved mightily. But I was so impressed because someone looked at a field and didn't just see dirt but they saw thousands of people that could resurrect an auditorium that would proclaim the powerful word of the Lord Jesus Christ. What could happen tonight if all of us could realize just what could God do with someone like me if I would submit to him and allow him to use me to the fullest of my potential? Let me just talk a minute. If you don't value the the person God has put into your life to speak into your life. Let me just say it this way. If you don't value the gift, you won't value the instruction. If you don't value the gift, you won't value the instruction. Please understand, you should never value any man or any woman of God more than they should be. Don't let a pastor, preacher, teacher take God's position in your life. Please realize that. Yet some in the church won't listen to godly instruction from their pastor and that's when the trouble starts in their life. You see, you need to have confidence in the man or the woman of God to believe that they are teaching you things that are for your good and not their gain. But I tell people even in my own church, if I can't correct you, then I can't teach you. I'm not here to be an aspirin in your life. I'm here to be a vitamin. Come on, somebody. I'm not here just to be an ibuprofen. Help me now. I'm here to be some vitamin C for you. You got to understand, I love you enough to tell you the truth because it's truth that sets people free. Now, we all have things we want in our life. And listen to me, this is profound. What you want, what you want, wants you to. I want you to hear this. What you want, wants you to. If you want bad, bad wants you to. If you want drugs, then drugs want you to. If you want alcohol, then alcohol wants you to. But if you want victory... Victory wants you too. If you want joy, joy wants you too. If you want peace, peace wants you too. If you want what's good, then what's good wants you too. If you want breakthrough, breakthrough wants you too. If you want success, success wants you too. If you want to be set free by the power of the Holy Spirit, then guess what? The Holy Spirit is in this place and he wants you to be set free by his power. You see, the purpose always has a price attached to it. The things you want have a price attached to them. The purpose then is to glorify God, amen? That's why we're here tonight. We're all here to glorify God. So if that's true, then your purpose is to bring glory to God. Why has God given you certain gifts? Let me ask it this way. Why don't cows drink milk? And why don't chickens eat eggs? <laughs> yeah. 
The reason? Because they produce for someone else. Does that make sense? So if you've got a gift, that gift may not be just for you. If you've got a gift to make some money, maybe all that money is just not for you. Maybe God's wanting to you to invest it into the kingdom of God and have eternal purpose and not just earthly purpose. You see, if you've got the gift to sing, that voice is not just for you. These singers tonight prove that. They ushered us into the presence of God because that gifting is not for them. It's for you. So if you've got the gift to serve, it's not just for you. It's for someone else. Jesus is saying it this way. You have to stay connected to me if you want what you do to flourish. Branches cannot boast in themselves. It is the fruit is the glory. The fruit is the glory of the vine. It tells people who you are connected to. How do you know it's an orange tree? It's got oranges. It's visible. How do you know it's an apple tree? How do you know someone loves Jesus? You can see Jesus on their branches from their fruit. Your purpose for succeeding is to bring the glory of God to fruition through you. You're living today to bring God glory. Now, let me kind of kick this up a notch. You've been good so far. Hang on. I'm going somewhere. You better be glad that you didn't quit when you got discouraged and frustrated because God is about to take that and utilize it for his glory. I'm talking to somebody tonight. The enemy comes. He attacks us all. No one is immune to the attacks of the enemy. We all face times of discouragement and frustration. And all the things that life has to throw at us sometimes is difficult, but God always comes through. Can I remind you that our God never wastes a hurt or a frustration in our life? Let me give you this third and final point, and I pray it will help you. The price of your next season is your pursuit. The price of your next season is your pursuit. The proof of pursuit is found in your desire. So hear me. Psalm 34, 4 says, Delight yourself also in the Lord, and he shall give you the desires of your heart. The reason why God doesn't give many people the things they want is because the wrong reason is attached to it. God has a way of blocking things in your life that will take you away from his presence. Can I remind you, there is nothing ever on the earth that's ever been created to replace the presence of God in your life. There's no human, there's no, there's no job, there's, there's just nothing on the earth that can replace the God factor in your life. That's why so many people are hurting today and frustrated because they are trying to find something to put in the place of God in their life. And nothing has ever been created to replace the God factor in your life. It's time God helps us shift. It's time God shifts us to the place we need to be. You see, it's important who you listen to. It's important who you put around you. You see, the well you drink from is the well you're going to think from. So when you drink from a man or woman of God's teaching, then you're going to, you're going to, Cultivate that culture. Proverbs 23, 7 says it this way. As a man thinks in his heart, so he is. So it's vital who you sit under, who you let him part into your life. I think this house has a blessing to be able to sit under this ministry and to be able to receive and drink from this deep well here at this great house. But the place, this, the price, I should say, of your next season is going to be your pursuit. I'll never forget my very first church I ever pastored many years ago now. As I was, uh, it was a small church, had two sections, a middle aisle, red carpet and red pews. Now get that. Wow. I mean, it was bright. 
We almost didn't need lights. I mean, it was so bright. But I'll never forget one Sunday morning. That's back when, as a pastor, we, I'd sit up on a platform and, you know, you'd kind of look out at the audience. I hated that, but I'm glad we stopped that. But anyway, I hope y'all don't do that here. I'm sorry. Uh, I may have overloaded my mouth. But I remember when, the, when a gentleman walked in the back door and I could see him walking. And, it's, and, you know, usually when someone visits your church, they'll maybe come halfway up or maybe toward the back. They just... They're just going to check you out. This guy kept walking. And we were right in the middle of worship, and he just kept walking. And he got all the way up to the, to the altar area. And, uh, and all of a sudden, I see him. He's weeping, just weeping. He was a small man, just maybe a little over five feet tall. And so I, as a pastor, you know, I just I went down. It's a small church. I mean, he's noticed. So I went down, and I, I, I met him, and I said, can I help you? And he looked at me in the eye as he was just crying. And he said, my name is Ken. I have AIDS. I'm dying. Am I welcome here? That was back when the AIDS epidemic was just getting full blown and we were learning about the origins and how to handle it. How do you, how do you handle that disease? There was a lot of fear in people. They didn't know what to do. And my instinct, I just quickly said, of course you're welcome here. I'll help you any way I can. And I embraced this man. He fell into my chest and he just began to weep. I found out his testimony. He, uh, he, he was in Los Angeles, California. He went out there and he became destitute, homeless. He was on the streets of Los Angeles, Skid Row. He became a male prostitute. And he had over 300 encounters with men. And he contracted the, 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 the virus of AIDS. He came home to his, uh, to his mother and father. He just came home to die. He had nowhere to go. And he was hurting. And the sad part is his father was embarrassed of him. And really didn't want anything to do with him. But he came to my church, a little church. And we began to love Ken. Ken gave his heart to Jesus at that altar. He began to come to our church. We began to love on him. We made him feel welcome. We stood with him as he was getting treated with, with uh, drugs and, and the things they do. And then one day Ken said to me, he said, do you think I could be a minister one day? I said, sure you can. He said, would I get papers and everything? I said, I'll get them for you. I said, we'll work on it. So I began to work with Ken about being a minister. And I began to help him develop his very first sermon. And as we were working on that, one day I was invited to preach in the Louisiana State Penitentiary. And so I went to preach and I took Ken with me. And I was in a small room with 600 of the worst criminals on the earth. And I was prayed up. There was no barrier between me and them. And Ken was with me. He was on the left side as I'm preaching like I was here. And, uh, and these, all these men in this room, and one of the biggest men I've ever seen in my life was standing over here on the right side. He had to be seven feet tall. There was no fat on that guy. One day God's going to let me be that way. But anyway. <laughs> but he stood, I'm not talking, seven feet almost. And I mean just muscles everywhere and I saw Ken looking at him as I'm preaching and I'm thinking don't you dare do it that's what I'm thinking in my mind the next thing I know when I'm giving an altar call I watch Ken walk all the way over and he gets right up to this guy's belly button some of you will get that in a minute and he points his finger up trying to talk to him and I mean with boldness he says, if you don't get saved, you're going to go to hell. And I'm thinking, he's going to eat you, Ken. You are really going to meet Jesus tonight. And I watched that big, tall man put his head down, and tears began to run down his face. And I watched that little guy lead that big guy to Jesus. Now, that's fascinating and wonderful, and I praise God for that. 
But when we got back, Pastor Reynolds, when we got back to that lobby of that church, I looked at him and I said, what is wrong with you? Why did you do that? Do you know what you did? We could, you could have been killed. He said, Pastor, I'm dying. It doesn't matter. But I wanted that guy to go to heaven because I know where I'm going when I die. I said, Ken, we're praying for your healing. He said, no. He said, God told me that I'm going to meet him soon. And it's okay. But I want to take as many people with me as I possibly can. As I continued to help Ken with his sermon, I noticed his health started to deteriorate. Then one Saturday morning early, I get a call from the hospice. And they say, Pastor Yarbrough, if you want to see him, you need to come now. So Kristen and my wife, we jumped in our car. We didn't have children at the time. We drove over to the hospice. We walked, as we're walking down to his room, this hallway, a nurse stops me and she says, Pastor, I just need to tell you, Ken's father was just here. He wouldn't go in. He just wanted all of his stuff out of the room and he's left and he said, call when it's over. I thought, how tragic. So Kristen and I, we walked in and I got to the head of his bed and she stood at the foot of his bed and she began to touch his feet and just let him know we're there. And I, I began to talk to Ken and I said, Ken, you're so blessed. Soon you're going to see Jesus and the, guess what? AIDS is not in heaven. There's no sickness in heaven. There's no sorrow in heaven. There's no tears in heaven. Ken, you're going to make it. And I could see a little smile on his face and it wasn't long. He took his last breath on the earth as we sang songs to him. I was asked, of course, to do his funeral. And I was standing in the biggest church in that city. And as I stood there and the casket was here and the dad was right there, I preached one of the greatest sermons I've ever preached. I'm going to tell you I did. But it wasn't my sermon. It was Ken's first sermon that he wrote. And can I tell you, people that day came to know Jesus Christ as their Savior. And when I went off that platform, I walked right up to that dad who was embarrassed of a son who had lived a lascivious life, made mistakes, but in his final days became one of the greatest men of God. And I handed him those handwritten notes and I said, this is from your son who was my friend. And I want to tell you, he was working on becoming a minister. And I also want to give you the ordination card that says he is a man of God. You can be proud of your boy. Friend, I want to tell you, never, never, never underestimate the power of God in a person's life. God has the potential to change everything in a moment, in a season, in a prayer. Come on, somebody. Now, let me give you four quick things. I promise I'm going to, I'm going to shut down quickly. In fact, I can have the, uh, someone to come and play. I'll, I'll get out of the way in just a moment. But let me give you four prerequisites as you shift into your next season. Number one, let go of what's not working and embrace what will. Too many people will not change. They refuse to change. But let me tell you something. God is moving swiftly in the hour we're living. And he is looking for people to live up to the potential that is in them. There are some things that have never worked. And there are some things that never will work. You need to ask God for wisdom to know when it's time to move on. Can I just tell you I know some things have filtered out of my life. I know I'll never be an NBA superstar. Come on somebody. I'm never going to be six foot nine. It's never going to happen. I'm never going to be a place where I'll be so physically fit. You'll see my abs only in heaven. Come on. I know I may never be tall, dark, and handsome. That's okay. If I want to be that now, I just go get to Christian and I get on a chair. I turn out the light. Come on, somebody. It's just the way it is. So I know I've got to change some things in order to gain some things. But some of us need to understand some things in our life are just not going to happen because it is not God's will for our life. Stop seeking validation from someone who will never validate you anyway. You don't need people at times who are just in it to use you for their gain. Don't go where you are tolerated. Go where you are celebrated. Shift 
your friendships. Understand where God wants to lead you. Understand where God wants to put you. When I got with my pastor, my pastor brought me into a realm of people I could never get to. He put me in places I didn't deserve to be. God put open doors for me that no man could open for me because he connected me to the people he wanted me to be with, not who I thought I should be with. Deuteronomy 2.3 says it this way, you have walked around this mountain long enough. Too many times we're like the Israelites, going around a mountain time after time, thinking it's going to change this time. Can I tell some of you, stop where you are, seek the face of God and allow him to change your direction. Number two, you are not damaged goods. You are not damaged goods. Even though you've been through damaging situations, you are not damaged goods. Look at your neighbor right now and tell him, I don't look like what I came out of. If you could have only seen where Jesus found me, you'd understand what I'm talking about tonight. Some people don't know the, the, the problems and the difficulties you came out of. They don't know you've not always been that person of praise. They don't know you've always been a greeter. They don't know that you've not always been some small group leader or some choir member or some usher or even some pastor in the room. They don't know what you came out of, but God knows and you know. Don't allow anything you've been through to limit your potential of what God is wanting to do in you. Can I just tell somebody to stop covering up your scratches? Show some of your scars. God uses those things. I've been through some stuff in my life. Can I just tell you? It's only by the grace of God I'm standing in South Africa preaching the gospel tonight. I don't deserve this, but God has put me in a place. I don't know how I got here. I don't know. I'm just telling you. I'm just following the will of God. I like to say it this way, hell lost another one. Yeah. Hell lost another one. Yeah. Romans 8, 28 says, and we know that all things, come on, say it. And we know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are the called according to his purpose. Thirdly, begin to see with the eyes of faith. Begin to see with the eyes of faith. Can I tell you, when I went to the assembly, where I am now is over five and a half years ago, God called me to go there. I went there, and when I walked into the assembly, I walked those 1,300 seats that are in that auditorium, and I began to pray over each one of them. And I told those seats, you will be filled. You will be filled. At that time, we were running just under 600 people. Can I tell you today, every seat in that house is full. We're at two services. We've also got another location now. We have $12 million worth of facilities and properties and all of these things. It's only by the grace of God. It's because someone walked in and said, I see something that is not, but I know the God who is. I know God can do something with nothing. He can formulate things out of thin air if he has to. But some way, somehow, every seat in this house will be filled. Get a vision of what God can do in your life. Get a vision of what can, God can do in your children's life. Get a vision of what God can do around you and through you that only God can do. Now let me just say this about people. Not everybody belongs with you. If your phone doesn't ring while you're struggling, then don't pick it up while you're winning either. Come on, somebody. Be careful who you let in your life. You see, I believe this. God rebuilds you in front of people who tried to break you. Trust me, you don't need revenge. You just need a little patience and a little bit of faith because your next will be better than your now. Come on, somebody. God's got something in store for somebody in this room. And when you get there, somebody's going to talk about how lucky you were, but you're going to remember the price you paid to get there. I'm almost done. I told you, this is my third, maybe fourth closing. I'll be there, but I'm closing. <laughs> and lastly, make decisions with God included. Make decisions with God included. Philippians 2.5 says it this way, let this mind, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Some people are going to think you're really smart you're just smart enough to listen to the voice of the Spirit of God. I'm not a brilliant person. You all see that tonight. I'm just smart enough 
to hear the voice of God. I'm thankful for his voice. The Bible says in Colossians 1, If then you were raised with Christ, seek those things which are above. Where Christ is sitting at the right hand of God, set your mind on things above, not on the things of the earth. For you died, listen to that, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. Too many times we try doing way too much on our own. We don't consult God enough. Stop going it alone and start walking with the Lord. You can go by trial or error, but I would rather go with the Lord. Don't try to be your own compass. Let the Holy Spirit lead you every step of the way. Let me give you two last verses and then I want to pray with people in this room. I apologize if I went too long. John 16, 13 says, When he, the Spirit of truth, comes, he will guide you into all truth. He will guide you. Proverbs 16, 1 says, We can make our plans, but the final outcome is in God's hands. Somebody in this room tonight needs the direction from God. Your potential is about to be released in the Lord. And I believe tonight God is going to accelerate some of that in your life this evening. Some of you need answers tonight. I believe God is big enough to provide those answers. Sometimes we wonder, how did we get here? It's only God's grace. Stand with me if you don't mind, please. And I want to pray with you. Then I'll ask pastor to come and take the direction anyway. But I want to pray with you tonight because there is potential in this room. Never underestimate the power of God. It is not by might. It is not by power. But it is by the Spirit of God. Tonight it's a simple message. It's really not that difficult. We've got to trust God more. That's the key to our potential is trusting in the Lord. Hearing the voice of God and walking with our God. If you're here tonight and you say, Pastor, you're talking to me. I believe God has more for my life. I believe God is bigger than the situation I'm standing in tonight. I believe God has something for me better than what I have now. Pastor, I believe God wants to eliminate the enemy in front of my eyes. If this is for you, I want you to lift your hands to the Lord as we pray together tonight. And I want God to move into your life. Pastor, friend, whoever you are here tonight serving in this church, come on, if this is for you, just lift your hands. Now, Father, in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, I ask you to fall on the people that have their hands in the air. Lord, some of these are men and women of God. They have trusted you a long time. But Lord, the enemy has fought them difficult, hard, frustrating. God, I pray tonight that you would move on the lives of your servants, your people. God, we curse the enemy in the name of Jesus. Hell, you will lose another one tonight. And we speak over the people of God in the name of Jesus. Touch them right now. Move every mountain. I refute every hindering force coming against you by the power of our God. Father, no weapon formed against them will overcome them. It may come, but it will not take them down. They will step over it when the battle is over with victory and joy. And Lord, I speak unto your people that blessing after blessing and favor after favor will come upon them so that they can do the work in the kingdom of God. Lord, there are great days ahead for this house, for this man and woman of God who lead this house. I pray, God, tonight that your spirit will move mightily upon them and, God, that they will be what you've called them to be. Father, I pray that prayers will be answered tonight in such a way that no human on the earth can take credit for what you are about to do, but that many would stand and say, that was the hand of God in their life. I decree this on this house in the name of Jesus Christ. And we believe it and we decree it by saying amen. amen. Now come on and give him some praise. Come on. You can do better than that. Our God is enough. Our God answers prayer. Our God makes a way. Hallelujah. Come on. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Pastor.